<laughs> Can you all hear me all right? I'm mean, going to apologize ahead of time. I have a nasty cold, so I'll try not to cough too loudly. But if you can't hear me, just put up a hand or something, and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to make myself understood. Um, so we're just going to jump right in and give you an overview of our historic green at the University of Delaware um, <coughs> with a focus on Marion Coffin's work and how that relates. Um, so our, our green started with, our, our basically the first master plan for the University of Delaware started with um, a plan that was designed by local Philadelphia architects. Frank Miles Day and Charles Clowder and a firm called um, Day and Clowder. They had been known at that time for work that included um, Princeton University, Yale, and Cornell. And um, their charge at the time um, their charge at the time was to connect the existing men's college at Del Delaware College, which um, is housed at Old College um, on our North Campus, and you see an image there of what it looks like today, um, with the new uh, women's college that had just started operation only a few years prior to their being hired in 1917. You can see an um, old image of Warner and Robinson Hall still located on our Southern Green. and. Their vision was um, that by developing attractive land in between the existing men's college and the women's college, about a half mile of land that was at the time known as kind of no man's land. It was a bit of a field, farm field at that time. Um, they envisioned a campus that would be unified through an extension of a formal green that extended from the men's college down to the women's college. And in, in tradition of many universities of the day, they, they thought about um, installing <coughs> formal alleys of trees and bisecting the green by a, um, a formal rotunda and building in the center, which you can see on that plan in the center, there's um, an outline of the building, which is now Memorial Hall that you see in the photograph and is where we are currently sitting. <coughs> Um, this is the day clutter plan as it has started to be implemented in the early 1920s. Um, the North Green, which still um, is preserved with American Elms, and the North Green being the space that's north of Memorial Hall all the way up to Main Street. In this photograph, they were just installed. Um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that the American Elms were largely destroyed by, by um, Dutch Elm disease. And so what goes in now is a, um, their selection of disease-resistant cultivars, which are basically American elms that have been bred from trees that survived that, um, that disease, and hopefully they'll be able to fight off the disease better. Um, shortly after the Dave Clogger Plan was implemented, uh, Marion Kruger Coffin was hired to develop a landscape plan for the historic green, but before I get into that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about who she was and some of her other significant works. Thank you, Sue. So, Marion Coffin was born in 1876 in New York City to a patrician, male-dominated society, and she needed to pursue a living out of financial necessity. She did come from a kind of a moneyed old family, but her father died at the age of 39 of malaria and left she and her mother with just $300 to their name. So while they kind of hobnob with the upper echelons of society, they, she didn't have money herself. Um, and so she wasn't interested in a lot of the professions that were available to women at the time. So she sought entry into the only landscape architecture program that started accepting women, which was at MIT. So this is a cool stereographic card showing the MIT drafting um, rooms that she would have been practicing and learning how to become a landscape architect in the Beaux-Arts tradition. So upon graduating from MIT, because she couldn't find work in a male-owned firm, she started her own practice. And um, 
She designed over 50 significant estate gardens in the northeastern U.S., and I've even seen that number um, higher than that. In her book, Trees and Shrubs for Landscape Effects, she articulated her design theory, and she was one of the first women to be recognized as a professional landscape architect with a clientele that included some of the wealthiest and most notable families in the country, including the Fricks, the Vanderbilts, the Huttons, and the DuPonts. Through her friend, Henry Francis DuPont, she, seen, she received many client referrals, as well as a significant commission winter tour near Wilmington, Delaware. So Coffin's firm began the commission for, at Winter Tour for Henry Algernon DuPont and his son, Henry Francis DuPont. Marion's mother was a bridesmaid at the wedding of Henry Algernon DuPont. And so because of their, her mother's close relationship with his wife, um, Mary Pauline Foster, she became close with Henry Francis DuPont and his sister, Isabella. So the first commission was for the Sunken Rose Garden, which you can see in the lower um, right-hand corner of this this slide. Um, the, the Rose Garden was um, Mary Pauline Foster's garden and has since been replaced by the Museum Studies Building. Um, this commission was one of her earliest in 1910 and 1911. Uh, in 1926, Henry Francis DuPont inherited Winter Tour from his father, upon his father's death. And from that time until 1955, Marion Coffin was um, very involved with the planning and design and layout of the Winter Tour grounds. Mr. DuPont, as you probably, many of you know, made the garden open to the public in 1951, and so his, his vision was always that this would be open as a pleasure grounds for everyone, and I think Marion Coffin contributed to that. So these images show the boxwood scroll garden, which would have been designed to be viewed from the rooms above, as well as the steps. Um, because of the very steep incline behind the house, um, the, she had created this ingenious design of these um, beautiful steps that create a formal alley and a formal access for the house, and that attaches to the swimming pool, which is now kind of the fountain. Continuing her work with the DuPont family, Coffin designed the Hugh Rodney Sharp Estate, uh, Gibraltar, in the city limits of Wilmington between 1916 and 1923. And Mr. Sharp was related by his marriage to Isabella DuPont, to Henry Francis, and so that would have been a recommendation by H.F. DuPont. And um, this estate was designed um, to reflect the house in a series of garden rooms. So it was a six acre estate, a two acre garden, and was very Italian in design, except it adapted some of the native plants of the U.S. Um, into these kind of more formal designs. So this is an example of the bald cypress LA. So instead of the cypress that you would see in Italy, they, she used a native bald cypress, and those would have um, been on the outside of a formal planting of ivy-covered walls and flowering shrubs. And one of Coffin's last commissions in the state was the Lamont DuPont Copeland Estate in Greenville, Mount Cuba. Today, Mount Cuba is a research center and botanic garden focusing on native plants. And Marion Coffin's plant selections here probably paved the way for that interest of the Copelands. Um, she selected many of our favorite native plants, like mountain laurel, <coughs> um, magnolia grandiflora, and others, um, but use them in kind of more formal ways in accordance with her Beaux-Arts training. Um, and one of the quotes that I love that she said that the, is that the right plant in the right place is in harmony with its surroundings, and that was her intention for the design here at the Mount Cuba. Uh, one, one more thing is that a lot of these images come from this great book, Money, Manure, and Maintenance by Nancy Fleming, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. So coming back to the University of Delaware where we left off, um, Marion Coffin was through her relationships with um, Hugh Rami Sharp and Lamont DuPont and um, Lamont DuPont's cousin, Henry DuPont, um, they were, they got to know her through her work on their private estates, as Anna has, has very nicely shared with you. And so they also recommended her to be the landscape architect and do the landscape plan for the campus. Um, and this came on the heels just a couple of years after the day Potter plan um, had started implementation. She maintained that um, formal geometry north of Memorial Hall in the form of those um, elm trees that had already been installed. 
she felt that that kind of structure was a little bit more um, reflective of gentlemen and sort of a masculine energy at the time. And then for the women's campus on the South Green, she introduced honey locusts, which have a little bit more of a delicate leaf a little bit um, installed in a little bit more of a regular organic pattern. She felt that just had a little bit more of a romantic kind of feminine style attached to it for the women's campus. In between, she developed a series of circles. The, the largest one in the center was a formal lawn that was called the dancing lawn with um, a whole series of paths that surrounded this area. Her, um, the, the, the green circle to the right is still can be seen today in um, the form of Magnolia Circle, where we now have the fountain on the South Green, which, which we'll see in our walk afterwards. But um, this is a close-up of that area, and you can see some of the circuitous paths that she developed with the wooded grove north of there, which was, or actually that would be west, um, where our Roselle Memorial Grove is, with many peach trees currently. The amphitheater that you see in there was never installed. There was a lot of her design that was impacted by the Depression in the 1930s. Um, but this area of campus was a place that she envisioned the men and the women could come and meet and walk, take respite from their studies in nature. And, um, and, and as Anna mentioned, you know, the, the idea of harmony with nature was, was something that you can see as a theme in a lot of her designs. This is a photograph of Magnolia Circle. It is, um, the fountain is not itself from this time, but the circular shape, the water, the um, plantings that surround it are all um, reflective of her design style. <coughs> Honey Lucas still exists on the South Green. This is an image of Robinson with Warner just south of it the original women's college, and um, we do, in the form of preservation, we do restore and keep honey locusts on the green. They might be a different cultivar, but we'd like to believe that if Mary Coffin were still alive, she would enjoy using some of these cultivars that we're using as well. But, um, you know, the historic greens and beautiful spaces on campus, public places, they do come with their challenges. Our, our green is over a century old, and through it, it has been well loved and well used. It is the place everybody wants to be. It's the place everybody wants to hold their events. It's the site that memories and photographs are made. You can see people today um, about to graduate in their cap and gown, standing on the steps of Memorial Hall, taking photographs and becoming part of that history. The challenge, though, is that modern amenities such as uh, steam pipes and um, underground utilities can really have an impact on the green. And this is what our green looks like typically after uh, commencement alumni weekend. Decide to pack up and go away. So there's, it's flavor intensive, and it's, it's, there's a price tag attached to restoring that back to its original intention and to the green that we all know and love. Um, and likewise, this was an image from the North Green. Many of you may remember a couple summers ago that the area between Delaware Avenue and Main Street was completely ripped up with uh, 50 foot wide swaths of trenching and huge steam pipes going in, very similar to what's going on out here in the South Green right now. But the goal was always that we put it all back and we put fresh sod down. And this was quite a logistical challenge to bring these um, elms back into the North Green without ruining our fresh turf and in and around students that were back in the dorms and making sure the trees lived. And so far, they're doing well. They're a cultivar called Princeton, which come out of Princeton, New Jersey. They're more disease resistant cultivar. We're hoping they stay that way. <laughs> But we did all this effort because our historic landscapes tell a story about those who have helped shape our cultural landscape, such as these students who were students of the Women's College at the time in 1917 to participate in planting trees on their campus. And we believe there's some anecdotal evidence at any rate, um, and there might be somebody who can confirm this, that they may have had a hand in planting some of the beech trees that are in our beech grove that's located between Allison Hall and Caesar Rodney. And, you know, just in closing, um, you know, historic places such as our green, they, they empower the current generation and future generations. Um, 
thanks to people like Marion Cougar Coffin, who by you know blazing her own trail of professionalism at a time when women really weren't um, involved in the field of landscape architecture, there were many doors still closed to women in those fields at the time. Um, she was able to open that door, and I mean certainly to, to people like Anna and myself and many other people who have um, adopted that profession is valuable. Also, we have a new Bachelors of Landscape Architecture program being formed, and Anna is very much involved in that, and these types of landscapes also speak to those current emerging professionals about the value of landscape, the value of the people that created them, and not to mention we all enjoy them, whether we're a professional or not. They're, they're places that we can see stories of generations that have come before and hopefully see the ones that are gonna come after us. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you and see if there's any questions, but um, we're also gonna take uh, just a, a quick walk around landscape and kind of enhance some of the things we've shared with you today. What we're gonna do when we're all ready is get up and meet on that north entrance of Memorial Hall on just on the veranda. We'll look at the North Green, talk about that a little bit, come back inside and head out the side accessible entrance towards Mentor Circle, walk from there up to the library, we'll look at South Green, talk a little bit about what's going on there, take any more questions, and then um, you'll be at your leisure to walk back for lunch. Was the Sharp House, what is called the Gibraltar House there on Pennsylvania? Yes. Any thoughts of doing anything about the star campus to make it look like something other than a parking lot? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there has been um, there has been a lot of discussion about that design, and it's it's um, being handled separately from the green. And there's you know there's a lot of different opinions about how you craft another type of quad and another enriched and rich space for um, not only people to walk through but to people. To gather and use, and you know, right now there there is a process going on, a master planning process that's asking some of these questions. So, so yes, there's been thought given how that gets resolved and implemented. At this point, is a little uncertain or unknown. So, is there any hope? <laughs> there's always hope. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's probably the most information I actually have about that at that time because it, it's being run as a little bit separate yeah, from the main campus, which is where my website is. Um, search for um, star master plan. Have, like, oh. There is a master plan that, that's, that, that is starting to be implemented for the infrastructure and road system mm -hmm. and stuff that really speaks to how you scale and uh, landscape. Shelly Einbinder jumped in. She's our associate architect for the University of Delaware. And what she said was you can look up on the website and search for STAR, and then you will see some information about the developments there. And, um, and certainly, we're both available to field any questions and answer them as best we can about that. Yes, uh, what about the other part of campus that was the uh, apartments that are now completely? Um, the dormitories. Right? Oh, the, the tall dorms up at the North Campus, yeah. up at Laird Campus. No, you mean the other ones on the other side of the Oh, Rodney's running. Yeah. That area actually has been um, sold back to the city, which is developing it as a, um, a stormwater park. And you, you can also search for that and, and look at what they're planning, look at designs and concepts. I personally think that's going to be rather exciting. I think it's going to be a nice amenity that it's, it looks like it's being designed so that it'll have um, open water and recreation, and I think it'll be a really nice um, feature to have that's adjacent to our campus, that's adjacent to those that also live in this community and work in this community, which I know there's many of us in this room, myself included. Um, so yeah, I've, I've looked at that too, so if you want to check that out, it is there. Yeah, it's been looking a little bit like a for a while. It does look a little change. abandoned, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, it's, it, it hasn't been lived in, and it's it's a challenge to have empty structures sitting around, and so, but that that is the plan for that for that space. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Any other questions?